You're listening to Bible Truth Feed, a podcast by Christadelphianvideo.org for Christadelphians and all those seeking the truth about the Bible message. Join us now as we present our latest episode. That all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect and thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So the Bible was not actually originally written in English. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. The New Testament was written in Greek. And it can be helpful, very helpful sometimes, to look at the original Greek word and see what the definition is in this New Testament passage. And when we do that, we find that the word inspiration, for example, is a very significant word. It's a word made up of two words. That means God and to breathe. And so it literally means, as other translators have translated, every writing of God is God-breathed. So when you think of it, there's, there's a significance to that, that it's God-breathed. That means that the men who wrote them down were somehow moved by God to write the words. And we'll also notice that it's profitable. It has a, a benefit to the reading of God's word, that it's profitable for Doctrine, which is really teaching, or reproof, which means to be admonished. It's good for correction, which literally means to straighten up again. And it can make one perfect, which has the idea of being complete. That someone might be thoroughly furnished or fully equipped unto all good works. And so this is what the Bible claims to be and and the benefits, some of the benefits that can be derived from reading it. Just to underscore this point, in in 2 Timothy, uh, 2 Peter, I should say, chapter 1, it says there that we have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well, do well that you take heed as unto a light. So he's talking about the Holy Scriptures that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. But the prophecy came not, for it came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So it's underscoring what we read in the first passage. These God-breathed words, these men were moved by God's Holy Spirit to write them. And, And Vine's dictionary actually makes the comment that the writers of Scripture did not put their own construction upon the God-breathed words that they wrote somehow guided by Holy Spirit of God. So truly, then, we would have to say that if we were to ask, well, what is the Bible? The Bible is the mind of God. It's God's thing written down for us to read. And so making the Bible a part of your life is really making God a part of your life. You see, God speaks to us through his word, and then he expects us to speak back to him through prayer. It's a relationship that we develop. And you know, when you think about having a relationship with someone, when something significant happens in your life, let's say you you get a raise at work, or, or you meet a long-lost friend that you hadn't seen for a long time, or, or you came across some positive news or some, of some sort. We'd want to share it with someone. 
your significant other or a parent or, or a friend. Or let's say there was some sad news. Someone at work got sick or your company is downsizing and you're worried. There's someone you'd want to tell and share this with. Well, this is what God expects us to do in prayer. He expects us to share our life with him. And to have that yearning to tell someone, we should have that yearning to include that someone as being God as well. And, you know, it works the other way too. If we have our phone and we notice that we have a missed call and there's a a flashing message on your phone, well, you feel the need to to pick it up and and to check it right away. And, well, what, what did I miss? Well, that's the word of God, isn't it? God's always got a message flashing for us. He's always waiting for us to pick up and and see what the message is. Because the Father wants to have a relationship with us. And, And Christ, as his representative, who will stand as the judge of us, has this to say about a man in, or people, in Matthew chapter 7. He says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done wonderful works? Then I'll profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me ye that work iniquity. And you see, this verse is describing a problem with a two-way relationship. Christ is speaking to these because they must not have read the Bible correctly. They had done things, but it said that they had not done what Christ says that they should have done. It wasn't the will of the Father. And at the, on the other hand, Christ says that he didn't know them. They must not have shared their life with the Father in prayer. And so we want to make the Bible a part of our life and read it correctly and match it with an open prayer life. But there's also a transformative aspect to the Word of God. You know, Timothy told us that the Word of God will teach us in ways of righteousness and that it's profitable for these things. In our reading this evening in Deuteronomy 6, it said that it would be our righteousness if we observe God's commands. And and it's also written, and this is found in the book of Revelation, interestingly, at chapter 1 and verse 3, it says, Blessed, blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. So interesting that this is, first of all, specifically found in the book of Revelation. And we might ask ourselves, well, so is that saying that if we read the book of Revelation, then there must be a benefit to it? Well, I guess I'll ask you to try that. Go home tonight and read the book of Revelation and and see if there's a benefit or a blessing to reading that book if you don't really understand what you're reading. I would say that if you haven't spent some time looking into this book and trying to understand what it means, you're going to find it confusing and probably frustrating beyond measure. And so looking closely at this verse, however, it's actually the point that this verse is making. Because it says, it's to he that readeth, to distinguish between, to to recognize and to know accurately. And to they that hear, which means to really understand and comprehend 
what you're reading, to perceive the sense of it. And it's to those who keep it, to guard it from loss, keeping your eye upon it at all times. So it's not merely to those to just read and hear in a surfacey kind of way. It's a blessing that's given, but it's to one who reads closely and considers and researches, if necessary, to get the understanding, and then guards that comprehension and stores it up in their heart. Well, this is what requires effort and a system. And in fact, many hours of reading will be required to say that you understand the Bible or the book of Revelation for that matter. And it will have to become truly a part of your life in order to see the benefits. Well, just a word on priority. So, so just what is the priority here of Scripture? Well, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, at verse 13, there's a verse there that says, this is written by an elderly man, the Apostle Paul, who's writing to a younger man, um, Timothy. And he says, uh, The cloak that I've left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee, and the books, but especially the parchments. So we might say, well, okay, interesting. Here's a request from an elderly man. He was in prison, by the way. He's in prison for a coat to keep him warm, along with some papers and books. I guess he needs some entertainment to occupy his time. Well, first of all, to note is that the prison that Paul was in is nothing like the prisons of today. And it was not at all like the prison arrangement that he had at the end of Acts chapter 28. It was a prison cell underground in Rome, in the days of the Emperor Nero. And it would have been very understandable that Paul would have needed a coat to try and stay warm in this dark, dank prison cell under the rocks of Rome. But what's this uh, needing the, the books and the parchments? Well, again, when we look at the verse and we see that the word book in the original Greek, is just a small book, a scroll, or, or a, a notebook, we might say in, in today's terms, a notebook for, for writing notes and letters and papers. The parchment, though, is a Greek word that has to do with a skin that comes from animals. It was a more costly thing to have. It was used to make permanent documents. And in particular, it was noted for making copies of the Old Testament scriptures. And so, well, why is this in the Bible? And I think it's there to provide us with a lesson on priority and motivation. You see, Paul's example is that while it's important to have the comfort of the body... The engagement of the mind is just as and, and maybe more important. The scriptures were a comfort and a strength for the Apostle Paul at a time of trial. And the notebook would have given him means to, to make notes and to write letters and to communicate with, with others that he was communicating with outside those prison walls. And he says it's especially the parchments, especially literally means the most important thing in the Greek, the parchments. That was Paul's priority. And so when we're in the prison of the trials of life, we might tend to focus on the cloak, things that provide us with a little more comfort. But it's also then that we can't forget about the books and the parchments. Because sometimes it's then that they can be very important as well. And maybe even sometimes the most important thing is making the Bible a part of your life. 
something to do when things aren't going well as well as when things is when they are going well. So the Bible teaches us how. It teaches us how to make the Bible a part of our life. And it was in this uh, chapter in Moses, uh, in Deuteronomy, sorry, where Moses, who had led the children of Israel uh, out of Egypt and then through the wilderness for 40 years, and now he's coming towards the end of his life, he's going to pass off the scene, and he gives his final instructions to the children of Israel before they enter into the land. And so it says in Deuteronomy 6, in verses 69, 6 to 9, these words. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Talk of them when thou sittest in thy house. When thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up. Bind them upon, for a sign upon thine hand, as frontlets between thine eyes. Thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and upon thy gates. Well, I would put to you that there are five points of instruction there for making the Bible a part of our life. The first one is that these words shall be in thine heart. You see, Moses' point is that the word of God wasn't meant to be just left, engraved on tables of stone or parchment skins or, or in a book. God wants them written on our hearts. He says in Proverbs, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And so the heart represents our thinking. And so really what I think this point is, is that the parts of the Bible are meant to be memorized. They're meant to get into our hearts, into our minds. And, and it's, it's interesting if you've ever spent time memorizing a section of scripture. You make a little piece of paper and you stick it in your shirt pocket or on your phone, I guess, these days, and you, you go through the day, and when you've got a few minutes, you pull it out, and you memorize a verse, and then you roll it over in your head, and then you memorize the next verse, and then you try and go back and get two verses together, and you work your way through. And what you'll find is that once you've got it memorized, and you say it to yourself, maybe from day to day, you begin to meditate upon it. And things slow down. And you're able to put yourself in the verse, in the story, and think about the application of it. And and then something comes up that you'd never even seen before or thought of before. And so you meditate upon the scriptures. And you know that some of the Bible is actually written in an acrostic form. That's where the first letter of a verse follows the lettering of an alphabet. So uh, first verse might start with A, second verse starts with B. Now, this is in the Hebrew or uh, perhaps the Greek alphabet, but I think the message is God intended the Bible to be memorized. Well, that's point number one. Point number two, it says that Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Well, if we're going to teach the Bible unto our children to make it a part of our life and a part of their life, then this starts when they're very young. And and we should know to have them sit through a Bible reading that we do. And and when they can speak and, and, and say things, we have them repeat verses. But, you know, we can make it interesting and we can make it fun as well. Uh, I can recall that um, our first daughter had her first two dolls who were named Sarah and Hagar. And we had a uh, plant in our living room that was kind of large. And um, we, I brought home a VCR recorder back in those days. 
and we went uh, set out to make a movie. So we had a little serpent that would kind of wrap itself around the plant in the living room, and we made a movie about the ongoings of the Garden of Eden. And, and we can join other families in this. We had another family in our neighborhood, and one time I was upstairs, and, and all of a sudden I hear this, this shouting and this banging and crashing in our living room, and, and I come downstairs to see four Levitical priests smiling at me. And the walls of Jericho tumbled all over our living room floor. And I've seen Goliath dead on our floor and Daniel in the lion's den there and, and girls get resurrected back to life. I mean, it's all happened in our living room of our first house. And then there's car rides. Well, when we you go on a car ride and you're sitting there for four or five or six hours and everybody's wondering what to do, we used to play a game called 20 Questions. So we'd all take turns and you pick a person, place, or thing in the Bible. And then you, others got to ask questions that you could only answer yes or no to and try and figure out what the person had in their head. The point is, the commandment of teaching your children diligently is given to parents. It's not given to Sunday school teachers or, or school teachers or, or grandparents or aunts or uncles. It's given to parents to making the Bible a part of children's life. Well, it goes on to say that we should talk of the scriptures. So that's the third point. Talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way when thou liest down and when thou risest up. And so we're being instructed to make an effort to talk about the scripture. I mean, it's enjoyable to talk about other things and, and uh, how's work going and, and how's this or that going or uh, what about the latest game or whatever it might be. But, um, but we can talk about scriptures and our discussion becomes elevated. Or, or sometimes, um, I've experienced this, I've, I've got a passage and I'm trying to figure it out, and it could go, well, it could be this way or it could be that way. And I spent, uh, thankfully, a, a brother was gracious enough to spend about an hour on the phone with me, and by the end of it, we had figured out pretty much what this scripture was saying. We felt very confident about that. And so this verse encourages us to weave the scriptures into the very fabric of our whole life. Not just on a, on a Sunday. It's when you lie down and rise up. You ever, you ever tried this? You ever, um, when you awake, ask yourself, what's the first thing you think of? Or, how long does it take you to think of saying a prayer? Or, or maybe think of some kind of a passage. You know, if you're in a relationship with, with anyone, a, 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 another husband, a wife, a parent, well, then you would say good morning and you would say good night if you're living in the same home. Well, what's the last thing you do before you fall asleep? Is it catching up on emails or the news or, or is it reading a passage? or saying a prayer, as if you were saying good night to the Heavenly Father. Well, the passage goes on to say that the scriptures should be bound, you should bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets before thine eyes. Well, your hands and your eyes are, are symbols for what we do in life, how we walk, where we go, what we see. Does the Bible direct us in the practical things of life? You know, the Bible, I'm sure we're all aware, instructs us to be honest. We're filling out a form, maybe it's a tax form or a customs form, and we have to write down a number. Are we 100% honest? Because I'll guarantee your flesh is going to think, well, 
really have to write down the real number or I could make it to my benefit. But, but we've got to say that the Bible instructs us to be people of honesty, that God hates lying. And so it has to work out as a practical outworking of how we live our life. When we're at work and, and oh, well, you know, I could use a pen at home as one. No. No, we're to be honest. We treat our employer as we would treat Christ. The Bible directs us to sacrifice our time for others. Do we make a mental note of others who who maybe could need a little something and ensure that we do just one thing to, to make that person's life just a little better. And so it has to be worked out in practical ways. It's part of making the Bible a part of our life. And lastly, it says, write them upon the posts of thy house and upon thy gates. And so I think the point is, is that our home has to be known for spiritual activities, Bible discussion. And with our family, the Bible should be the topic that infects all of our life. When visitors come over, what's the the general topic of the conversation? Do we read from scriptures before or after a meal with friends? And so... I think we can see that, hopefully you'll agree, we need to make the Bible a part of our life. And we might even put the instruction of Deuteronomy 6 to work in our life or in our family's life. But how do we we really and truly make it a part of us so that it's something we know intimately? So that it's what we think about most of the time. So that God's breathed words become our breathed words. In other words, we might have a goal, but what's the plan? And so I came across this this little quote here that a goal without a plan is just a wish. And it's written by this this French person here, Antoine uh, Saint-Exupéry, I think that's how you say it. Uh, he was a writer, and by the way, he was also an aviator. So uh, I thought that was a, a good guy to quote. Um, so if the making the Bible a part of our life is the goal, what's the plan? Well, certainly, we need a reading plan. And so uh, Christadelphians follow a reading plan, something we call the Bible Companion. And and furthermore, in the introduction of this Bible Companion, there's a quote there that talks about salvation and the importance of reading the Bible and how it takes a lifetime to really accomplish this getting the mind of God into our minds. It is a work of slow development that can only be achieved by the industrious application of the individual to the expression of the mind, God's mind in the scriptures of truth. The infallible advice to every man and woman is read the scriptures daily. And so Christadelphians follow this plan and you're recommended to follow this plan, but you don't have to. But I would recommend to have a reading plan. And it might be to read sections of the Bible, or it might read, be to read it all from just start from cover to cover. But if you do, make a schedule. Make a schedule. Or Maybe you set out to have a a short, your your time to read is to pick a short book and to read it in one sitting. So read it. Maybe read it twice. Maybe read it five times. But take the time to read the scriptures daily. Now, I know that some of you sitting there will say, well, oh boy, I'm busy enough through the day. I got to include this too. But you know what? It's no excuse. We do have time. 
you can now play the Bible on your phone or on your device. So you can play it in the car when you're driving back and forth to work rather than listening to to music or the news. You can play it while you're walking. You can read during a lunch break. There's always 15 minutes a day here or there that you can steal to read. And, And truly, there's no excuse to not having a Bible because we can put them put it on our phones. Okay, we've got a goal and we've got a plan. We need one more thing. We need to have an objective to our reading. It's not as effective just to read without having an objective to our reading. You need to have a purpose, something to look for when you're reading. And so the objective is to look for a theme. Look for a theme or look for a word. And as you come across this theme or this word in your reading, summarize what you learn and write it down in, like Paul, a notebook. So When we open up the Bible to Genesis chapter 1, we read in the very beginning of Genesis, verse 3, God said, let there be light. And there was light, and God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And that's what Genesis 3 and 1, verse 3 and 4 says. So I put to you, start reading the Bible, And look for the word light. And you say, why? You'll see why. Look at this first verse. It says that there's light. Well, just take a minute and think about what God did with the light. He separated light from darkness. Ah, so maybe that's something to note down, that light and darkness don't go together. They're separate. Okay, so maybe you're reading along a little further and you come to Psalms and you read in Psalm 119 that thy word, the word of God, is a light unto my path. Oh, that's kind of interesting. Maybe I should write that down. Somehow the word of God is associated with light. Maybe there's something more significant than just light in a room. And then you come across to a verse like this in Isaiah 8, which says, if they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. Oh, so we can have God's word, we can have light somehow in us, and if it's not according to the word, so what does that mean for people who just live a really good life, but they don't have faith? Well, it says it's not according to God's word, it must be that... Ah, we can make all kinds of conclusions and start drawing connections together. And now we're beginning to learn about this subject and this theme. Something as simple as light. We come to the very last reference of light in the Bible at the end of Revelation, that there will be no night there, no candle, neither need of, of light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. There's no more night. There's no more need of sun or stars. God's given the light. It seems like the first verse where we find it in the Bible is reversed, and it's all undone in the last verse where we find it. So I challenge you to go through the scriptures, start with something easy, like light. Another example would be the word seed. Look for all the places where you come across the word seed. So now we have an objective to our reading, something to look for, and I guarantee you, you will gain an understanding of the scriptures, and you will have joy to making it a part of your life. So to move on from that, maybe you're, you're used to doing that. Maybe you already do that. Well, then I would recommend that you do a study. Take a, a book or a section of scripture and do a study on it. 
Maybe you start with a small book, a book that has only two or three chapters, and you read that book. Read it again. Read it five times. Read it ten times. Read it to the point where you've almost got it memorized. Then read it in a different version. Look up a different version and and read it again. Then you might start doing some research. Then you might start looking at some resources that I could recommend, and that would be, depending on your level, you might look at a kid's camp workbook that Christadelphians have put together, or a youth conference workbook that Christadelphians have put together that show you step by step how to do an in-depth major study on a section of scripture. And you will find that your mind will be rolling over these passages and over this section of scripture and pondering them while you're driving, while you're walking, and you'll be going through life and on your break you're thinking about them and you're applying it to life and looking for ways it can be applied to life. And now the Bible is truly becoming a part of your life. Well, we like to finish with this thought. And that is this. You know, I was reading that there are are two ways you can go through life. You can go through life where you're living with attention. Attention to things. And and so I read that attention-driven people receive impulses from their environment and react to them. Impulses might include your phone ringing, a traffic light turning red, an advertisement. And the impulses give you the feeling of being very busy and energetic as you attend to these impulses. The only question is, where will they take you? In other words attention-driven people are mostly doing things for their own purpose, whatever grabs your attention or their attention. But unlike attention-driven people, there are intention-driven people. And intention-driven people focus on a higher purpose that they have in mind. They don't do something just because it comes their way. They do it because it contributes to their intention. They realize that the time that they have here on earth is not unlimited. And so they organize themselves in such a way that everything they do has a reason. And so they choose with the time that they have. So the Bible tells us that our intention should be to make God's mind our mind. And then take that mind and contribute to the lives of others. And so we'll finish with an interesting example in scripture of two women, Mary and Martha. It says in chapter 10, of Luke, it came to pass that as they went, and he, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, entered into a village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. She had a sister called Mary, which also sat at his feet and heard his word. Martha was cumbered about, much serving, and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she Come help me. Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Now, we might say that, well, there's a house full of guests and and Mary needed, Martha needed to be attending to the service, and, and, and that is true. But indeed, Martha was also dealing with attention, the things that had grabbed her attention. 
And although Mary perhaps should have lent a helping hand, she was more focused on her intention and the priority of having the Lord Jesus Christ in her home and listening to what he had to say. And so may it be, people, that as we endeavor to make the Bible a part of our life, we might see that one, this one thing as being needful, and then it truly shall not be taken away from us. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found the episode helpful. Don't forget, most of these episodes are also available as videos on our video channel, cdvideo.org. So head over and take a look. If you have any comments or questions or suggestions, please get in touch or leave us a voice message. We love to hear your feedback. You can email us at bt f at cdvideo.org If you enjoyed the episode, then please share it with others. Until next time, may God bless you in your studies and your walk towards God's kingdom. Amen.